three, two, Um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Johnny Lee. I'm head of radiotherapy physics here at uh, UHD. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about oops, I'm just move that off the right side. Um, about radiotherapy. Um, a couple of introductions first. Um, so I'm a physicist, I am not a doctor. Um, if you try and ask me, you know, what that lump is, um, or what your prognosis is, or is this lump dangerous, I won't have a clue. Um, I did a physics degree at Durham, uh, joined the NHS shortly after that, um, and this has been my career so far. Um, radiotherapy is something that people have heard of. Um, they know that it's using radiation to treat cancer, um, but I, what I thought is I'd take the opportunity uh, now to tell you um, how it actually works. Um, as an overview, um, things I want to talk to you is just kind of a little bit about physicists in healthcare, because there's quite a lot of us, but uh, you wouldn't necessarily know about them. Um, how we make radiation in the hospital, what that radiation does to um, kill cancer and the effect it has on cells, and what happens uh, when you come to the hospital for radiotherapy. So, um, any time radiation is used in a hospital, from having an X-ray done in an A&E for a broken arm, um, or if you need some kind of interventional cardiology and someone needs to put a stent up into your heart, and you, they use fluoroscopy to uh, effectively kind of give an X-ray movie of what they're doing at the time, all the way up to radiotherapy treatment, a physicist is always in the background, making sure that everything's safe and that no more than the necessary amount of radiation is used. Um, Generally, if you see one of these trefoils, uh, there's never a physicist too far away. Uh, the kind of things we do, um, we'll optimize settings on machines to improve image quality. Um, so making the uh, an accurate diagnosis far more likely. Um, we have a large role in designing and testing uh, radiation shielding that helps keep staff and patients safe. Um, for some things, that's as simple um, as making sure people stand back a few meters from uh, where the radiation activity is going on. Um, in radiotherapy, it involves designing concrete bunkers where the walls are up to two meters thick of concrete in places. Um, that's these enormously heavy structures. And the kind of things that you're probably more used to seeing um, if you go in A&E and having a normal X-ray is the radiographer standing behind a few millimeters of special um, sort of leaded glass. Um, yeah, um, radiation shielding is quite a big part of the job. Um, even in something like MRI, where there's no actual um, ionizing radiation as such, but there's very strong magnetic fields, physicists um, do a lot of work optimizing the sequences um, on those scanners to get the best images, and also um, sort of controlling the, sort of the safe environment to make sure that it's safe for both staff and patients. In radiotherapy, doctors prescribe radiation in a very similar way to how they prescribe normal drugs. And the role of a physicist is very similar to that of a pharmacist. It's our job to make sure that the right patient gets the right amount of radiation in the right place. Um, it sounds simple, but as we go on, you might get the feeling that there's actually slightly more to it. Than that. Um, so in the hospital, um, the majority of radiotherapy is delivered using what's called a linear accelerator um, or LINAC for short. Um, the other type of radiotherapy that's given is brachytherapy, which involves the insertion um, in a surgical procedure of radio um, radioactive seeds about the size of a grain of rice, um, uh, of which effectively is um, the place inside the cancer um, and they effectively irradiate it from the inside out. But most of what I'm going to be talking about today um, is doing what was called external beam radiotherapy, where X-rays are produced by a machine and they deliver beams of radiation into a patient and cure their cancer, hopefully. Um, the modern linear accelerator is something of a technological marvel. Um, it, just in brief how it works, because it's highly likely you haven't seen one before. Um, they are quite rare. Uh, patients lie on a couch and the machine will deliver uh, beams of x-rays from different angles to target the patient's cancer. The couch can move left, right, up and down, um, the floor rotates, 
um, to line up the patient exactly with the radiation beams, and we can do that within a fraction of a millimeter. Um, the newest couches, which uh, due to charitable funding from the Robert White Fund, um, we've just received, our new couches are also able to tilt the patient sort of in, in pitch and yaw to account for any small rotations in the patient as well. Um, the technical design of the machines is quite incredible. The head of the machine itself weighs several tons and that weight is all out at the end here, several meters away from where it's actually hinged to the, um, uh, the base frame. In spite of the fact that the head of this machine weighs several tons, most of it's lead, um, the head is packed with lead to minimize stray radiation, the whole machine will rotate with sub millimeter accuracy. Even things like the couch um, are made from carbon fiber. They're incredibly strong, but they're almost completely transparent to radiation. Uh, the arms on the sides of the necks can extend. Uh, so this is um, a KV tube, we'll come on those in a little bit. Uh, and this is an imaging panel here and effectively built into our linear accelerator is a CT scanner. Um, so when the patient's initially set up, we can take a CT scan of the patient and we can line them up, not to their external markers, but we can actually line them up to their internal anatomy and deliver radiation straight to the tumor. Um, this video, hopefully it displays some things crossed, um, gives an idea of what happens. So the gantry of the machine rotates, the radiation beam comes on, and as the head goes around, the, uh, the tumor gets treated with a beam of radiation. And this is what is known as arc therapy. And approximately 50% of our patients receive treatment in this form. So you can see there's a little tumor there in red and a beam of radiation comes on, the gantry moves around and a beam of radiation is delivered. Um, in reality, the machine does not move this quickly. Um, that would be both unsafe and terrifying. Um, it moves at about one revolution per minute. So if you think about how fast the uh, second hand on your watch moves, it's that speed. So this is, about 20 times faster than it actually moves in real life, which is probably a good thing for all concerned. Um, what I give myself the challenge of today is trying to tell you how all of this actually works. Because um, rather than waving our hands and saying, oh, isn't it magic? Isn't it incredible what they do these days? I thought I'd have a go at actually telling you how it works. Um, so what we're talking about are X-rays and how we're using X-rays to treat cancer. So first of all, what are X-rays? Um, how do we make them and what do they do to our bodies that make them useful for treating cancer? Um, so X-rays are a type of electromagnetic radiation. Um, you can see the, um, the EM spectrum here and it's all stuff that you've heard of. So at one end with a very long wavelength, you have radio waves um, capable of traveling well, essentially the whole way around the planet. If you think of the BBC World Service. Um, there's microwaves and we'll come back to those because um, they're rather crucial to be involved. Everyone's used to the um, visible spectrum. It's what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, infrared, ultraviolet, you will have heard of as well, and X-rays sit here in the spectrum. Um, so the visible spectrum is everything that we see. Um, it's what you see on your TV. Uh, it goes from red at one end to violet at the other. Either side of that is radiation that we know about. Um, so for example, you can feel infrared as heat. So if something's very hot and you can feel the heat radiating off it, what you're feeling is infrared light effectively traveling through the air and heating up your skin. So even though you can't see infrared, you can actually feel it. On the other side of visible light is ultraviolet. It's invisible light that as we all know can burn us if we stay out too long in the sun. The reason ultraviolet can harm us um, is that as we move to the right of this spectrum over here, um, the particles of light have an ever increasing amount of energy and it can penetrate deeper into our bodies and cause chemical changes in our cells. Ultraviolet in itself is relatively easily stopped. If you don't want to get sunburned, all you have to do is put on a hat and a t-shirt. X-rays are the next one along. So that's what we're looking at. Um, they can penetrate much more deeply than ultraviolet and as sort of makes sense, uh, they can actually go straight through us and come out the other side. And if you've got the right camera and detector, it effectively allows us to see through things. Um, 
hence the term X revision. So how do we make X rays? This is the part which I have to apologize for in advance. This is this is your quick physics lesson lesson in advance um, of the rest of the talk. So as you'll hopefully remember from school, um, everything is made up of atoms. Um, within atoms, there are protons and neutrons um, at the center in the nucleus and orbiting around the outside are electrons. Electrons are negatively charged, very small particles. Um, unlike light, they actually have a little bit of mass, but they weigh almost nothing. Atoms are neutrally charged overall with the number of positive protons and negative electrons balancing out. And here we're going to cover the entirety of chemistry in 10 seconds. Atoms will borrow, share or donate electrons from neighbouring atoms in order to bond with them. And once two atoms have bonded together, you start having molecules. So you can have very simple molecules like oxygen that we breathe in that are quite simply two oxygen atoms bonded together. Um, you end up with kind of quite light uh, things like gases, so methane, uh, just one carbon atom with four hydrogens around the outside. Um, so other molecules that you'll know from day-to-day -day life, caffeine, it's a relatively small molecule. Um, it's quite a big effect on all of our lives. And at the far end, DNA. Um, DNA is something that we'll come back to later, but one of the things to remember for this talk is that all molecules are held together by neighbouring atoms sharing electrons, and that's what bonds them together. So back to X-rays, how do you make them? What you do is you take some free electrons, uh, so electrons that are not bound as part of an, uh, of an atom. Uh, you can just get those from an electrical supply. You accelerate them to give them lots of energy. You fire them into a metal target, and as a uh, those high energy electrons hit the target and slow down, the energy they lose is released as X-rays. Um, just repeat that, high energy electrons, you slow them down suddenly and the energy they lose is given off as a spray of X-rays. That's, um, that's basically it. So that's easy, wasn't it? So the question then becomes, all right, well, how do we get some high energy electrons? Um, if you go to A&E and with your broken arm um, or even inside a CT scanner, X-rays are produced by what's called an X-ray tube. Um, there's a, a filament. Um, if you think of the old light bulbs with that kind of a little coil of metal, um, they look almost identical to that. That is the source of electrons in an X-ray tube. Um, a voltage is applied over a gap. Um, that voltage makes the target over here positive. Our negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged target. And as they're accelerated across that gap, um, they gain energy, they thump into the target, and you get a spray of X-rays produced. This works for up to 300,000 volts, which sounds a lot, but in X-ray terms, it's it's Sony's my first X-ray tube. Um, it's kind of the bottom end of things. Um, this is very useful for um, imaging and for treating very superficial cancers. So either on the skin or just underneath. If you want to have more penetrating X-rays, and for deep-seated cancers in the body that we normally treat in radiotherapy, we do, we'll need some high-energy X-rays. So how do we make those? Um, we use microwaves. Um, it is the technology that you have in your home microwave oven is exactly the same technology that we use to make high-energy X-rays here in the hospital. Um, whether you knew it or not, Everyone's actually aware that microwaves accelerate electrons. And you know that because if you put something with free electrons in it, like a metal spoon, into a microwave and turn it on, you get lots of sparks. Those sparks are free electrons in the spoon being accelerated by the microwave and ionizing the air around it. 
please do not try this at home. Feel free to look it up on the internet. There are YouTube videos, but do not do that at home. It will probably set on fire. Um, I have no idea who's listening, but if there are children, do, just don't. Just don't. Um, other people have done it for you first, and it's all there on YouTube to see. Um, so next uh, physics lesson on in this talk is how do microwaves work? How does your microwave oven work? Um, microwaves work using uh, devices called magnetrons. Um, magnetrons, um, as a physicist, you're allowed to have a favorite invention, and the magnetron is mine. Um, invented in the early 1900s, uh, magnetri uh, magnetrons were used very successfully in radar systems in World War II. Um, they're still used for that purpose even today. They have no moving parts and they're incredibly reliable. Um, it's exactly the same technology that's in your microwave oven and it's the same thing that's in our linear accelerators here in the hospital. Um, these pictures look quite complicated, um, but in reality, um, if you've ever blown across the top of a milk bottle to make it play a note, you've done the same thing as a magnetron in a way. Um, so when you blow across the top of a milk bottle uh, and make a note, or indeed if you blow across the, um, the mouthpiece of a flute, um, what you're doing um, is making the air in that bottle or in that flute vibrate at certain frequencies. So what happens is air passing over the opening contains lots of sound frequencies, but the ones that resonate in the bottle are picked up and they reverberate. And what you hear is the oscillation of air pressure inside the bottle. Magnetrons work in exactly the same way. What you have is a rotating cloud of electrons passing over the openings of lots of cavities. The cavities are like the milk bottle. And the electric field in um, the magnetron vibrates in exactly the same way as the air pressure in the bottle vibrates as well. The vibration in the cavities causes the electrons circulating to actually bunch up, uh, which further magnifies the effect. And the vibration in the electronic field inside a magnetron is the right frequency to produce microwaves. So the next time uh, you heat something up in your microwave and you hear something power up, it's your magnetron. And there's a little cloud of electrons moving in a circle, resonating in these cavities, producing those microwaves. The only difference in the one that's in our linear accelerators is ours is considerably beefier than the one in a home microwave. Oh, it does work. Sorry, there's an animation. Yep, there are the, um, the electron cloud uh, rotating around, resonating in the cavities, and there's an oscillation positive and negative electric field inside the magnetron and essentially all microwaves are is a very fast oscillation of the electric field so in our linear accelerators um, how does this all work well in the head of the linear accelerator there's something called a waveguide and it does exactly what it says on the tin it guides waves microwaves are injected at one end of the uh, waveguide and they travel down the waveguide um, like waves in a wave machine. Okay. So it's literally like microwaves are injected at one side and they travel down, they're a traveling wave, and they move down the waveguide. So they start up at the center and they travel down here. Um, electrons are injected in pulses into the waveguide and like surfers on a wave, they are carried and accelerated by the microwaves and they absorb energy from them. So literally what you have uh, happening many times a second are pulses of electrons surfing microwaves down the waveguide. And as they do it, um, they're picking up energy. By the end of the waveguide, the electrons now have up to 10 million volts. So if you think that the X-ray tube that we looked at before could do 300,000 volts, we're now up to 10 million. And that is enough to make some very high energy X-rays. Um, by the time they're at the end of the waveguide, they're traveling just a fraction slower than the speed of light. And due to some strange physics effects, they're actually heavier than when they started. Um, things can't go faster than the speed of light. So as things approach the speed of light, if you want to give them any more energy, you can't make them go faster. They actually get heavier. 
Um, the reason a linear accelerator is called a linear accelerator is because the electrons are accelerated in a straight line. Um, this is different to what we might have heard about in the news um, with things like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, they are cyclotrons, so things are accelerated in a circle. They go round and round and round, like holding a bucket on a rope, spinning it round until they're let go and they fire out. Um, we just accelerate things in a straight line. In our machine, that very fine line of high energy electrons comes along here, does a loop the loop, thumps into a target, um, and what you get is a very high energy spray of, of X-rays um, coming out the head of the machine. So that's how we make X-rays here in the hospital for treating cancer. So what does that radiation actually do to our bodies? Um, I said that we'd uh, return to DNA, DNA, and here it is. So in our body, um, in almost all the cells of our body, there is a prize for those who know uh, which cells of our body do not contain DNA. Um, the vast majority of cells uh, have a nucleus, and in that nucleus, uh, there are chromosomes made up of DNA. And these are the instructions of how the cell should operate. Um, everyone knows the famous sort of double helix structure. Um, and within that structure, genetic information is coded in a sequence of what are called base pairs. Um, effectively, it's an entire language, but it's just made up of four letters, um, T, A, G, and C. And from that four letter language, um, all life as we know it comes. In each cell um, of the human body that has a nucleus, uh, there is over a meter of DNA. It is an incredibly long molecule. And as we talked about earlier, it's held together by chemical bonds. So here you can see these um, amino acids held together. You see these, essentially every little kind of stick here represents a chemical bond. And the rungs of this ladder are held together in the sugar phosphate backbone um, by more chemical bonds. The whole thing is just lots of atoms held together by lots of chemical bonds. What radiation does is it acts effectively as a very indiscriminate pair of scissors, randomly chopping up DNA into lots of little pieces. Our cells are very, very good at repairing that damage, um, but it depends what kind of damage is sustained. So breaks of a single strand of DNA relatively easily fixed as the helix provides a template for what's missing on the other side. So if an X-ray comes through and it will kind of to knock something out here, when the cell comes to repair it, they know from the other side what's meant to be here because the um, uh, amino acids always uh, come in pairs. If, however, there is what's called a double strand break, that's much harder to repair because effectively you have two ends of DNA flailing round in your cell. And if when the X-rays interact, they don't only just make a double strand break, but they also delete a section of genetic code as well, the cell has no way of repairing that. Um, what I want you to kind of to take from this is that sufficient DNA damage to a cell generally results in the death of the cell either by apoptosis, which is effectively a biochemical way of the cell um, effectively kind of ending its own life, uh, but on a cellular level, um, or a form of kind of necrosis or potentially senescence where effectively the cell doesn't necessarily die, but it just stops and doesn't do anything anymore. And when you think that cancers are made up from cells that are rapidly dividing, um, what we're after is for the death of those cells, or at the very least, for them to stop dividing. That is a um, yeah, that's a thing, you know that, that's a win in terms of uh, treating cancer. The thing that is critical for radiotherapy is that healthy tissue generally is better at repairing than cancer tissue. It's based on that that most things hinge in radiotherapy. So a course of radiotherapy is split up into multiple treatments. At each treatment, um, or what we call a fraction of the radiotherapy, at each treatment, um, a fraction of the cancerous cells are killed and some are damaged. At the same time, some healthy cells are killed and some are damaged. 
but crucially, the healthy cells are better at repairing the damage. When you come to the next treatment, um, a lot of the tumor cells, which are the damage that was sustained in the last treatment is still there. Um, and that is effectively how you differentiate between killing tumor cells and healthy cells. Now, over a course of treatment, if it's successful, all the cancer cells will be killed. Um, but how some damage is caused to the surrounding healthy tissue, and that's where the side effects of radiotherapy come from. Most of our work in our department is actually spent trying to minimise the damage to healthy tissues from radiation. And what I'll talk about now is how we do that. Um, one of the basic principles of radiotherapy is that if you deliver treatment from a wide range of angles, um, it's better. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. So here we have a patient's CT scan and at the centre is a cancer that we'd like to treat. In this case, it's prostate cancer. We want to treat the cancer, but we want to minimise damage to everything else. And now being a physicist, what I'm going to do is massively oversimplify everything. So if you think of the green oval in the centre as being the cancer that we're trying to treat and the red oval around the outside as being the outline of the patient's body. If we were just to treat this tumour with a single field of radiation, um, we would cause huge damage to the patient where the radiation enters. Um, you get more dose closer to the surface and it tails off as it goes through the patient. So in order to deliver a decent amount of radiation to the tumour that had any success of killing it, if we only did it with one field, we would deliver a colossal amount of radiation. Um, you could sort of say upstream of the tumour. If you have two beams in opposite directions, what you've done is you've kind of reversed your losses. So everything kind of balances out, but everything from the left of the patient to the right of the patient would receive about the same amount of radiation, which is better than where we were before, but it's still not great. When you add in a third beam, you can start to get the feeling of how things are improving. What you can now sense is that there's this sort of box where the radiation beams all overlap and there's going to be a concentration of radiation there that's hotter than all the beams that are um, contributing to it. Four beams makes things better still and what you're starting to see um, get a feel for is actually the more beams you have the better and how we treat a lot of our patients now as we showed in the early, earlier animation is essentially we treat in a continuous arc. Um, we turn, uh, start the beam off uh, normally sort of at six o'clock effectively, turn the beam on and it's delivered in a continuous arc, effectively delivering from all directions. And you can see how the radiation beams accumulate around the cancer and the rest of the body receives a relatively low amount of radiation. So you've got X-ray beams concentrated there treating the cancer and the entrance dose as we call it, is smeared out. One of our huge limitations in radiotherapy is that in order to treat um, anything, um, effectively you have to irradiate on the way in, treat the tumour, and then the beam carries on on the way out. Um, and uh, there is technology on the way that um, uh, is sort of uh, set to deal with that. Um, some of you might have heard about proton therapy. Um, if I sort of go back to this slide, um, if this was a proton beam, what you would have would be something that looked uh, quite like a low level of radiation. It would then irradiate the tumour and then it stops dead. Um, protons work very different to X-rays. Um, X-rays, um, as you go into a certain depth, you lose 10% of them, then you lose 10% of what's remaining, 10% of what's remaining but you never actually completely lose your entire radiation field. The way protons lose energy is somewhat different. Protons lose energy um, in radiotherapy, like when you skim a stone across the water. Um, they bounce along in a certain number of interactions, and just before they lose all their energy, they sort of dig into the surface and then they stop. 
no one ever has skimmed a stone and it just carried on forever and protons are the same they lose energy continuously then deposit quite a lot of energy just before they stop dead um, there's only two nhs centers in the country that um, offer that for deep-seated tumors uh, they are at the christie in manchester and uclh um, in london um, i think uclh is just at the point of starting to treat uh, patients now um, and there was um, and there still is a proton center at clatterbridge cancer center on the wirral um, that is used to treat tumors at the back of the eye again it's an incredible treatment where radiation is fired directly into the front of the eye it treats tumors at the back of the eye and then the radiation stops dead so all the things that are precious behind your eye don't receive any radiation at all there we go so um so that's kind of our sort of simplified model of how radiotherapy works in practice things are a lot more complicated but the same things apply so rather than having one simple target um, doctors actually outline both the target volume and also healthy tissue that they want to avoid so here for example is um, a scan of a patient what the doctor would like to treat are in these uh, enclosed by this red and blue volume here so it's actually quite a large part of the brain and what you can see at the front here is the doctors have uh, outlined um, the eyes the eye lenses the lacrimal glands that make uh, that produce your tears the optic nerves that carry signal from the eye to the rest of your brain and the brain stem itself which carries information from your brain to the rest of your body all of those things are things which if they receive too much radiation um, to put it mildly will stop working to some degree that is I mean, essentially the all that you can't overstate how um, bad side effects can be for radiotherapy patients if this isn't taken into account um, from having over radiation of your lacrimal gland and then having dry eyes um, to potentially receiving too much radiation to your optic nerve and effectively going blind in one eye like i said one of the things we spend a huge amount of time doing is making sure that organs at risk as we call them uh, in the healthy tissue surrounding the tumor do not receive too much radiation and this is what um, our treatment planners can do uh, so the treatment planning team in my department i uh, use specialized software to plan radiotherapy treatment uh, we now have the ability to um, effectively place radiation um, around precious structures so you can see here are the eyes and the optic nerves and the chiasm where all that information uh, is, comes together and we can have enough radiation to treat the tumor but that radiation effect um, or that level of radiation stops just shy of those nerves and likewise if you sort of take a slice of down through the patient um, you can see that we're sort of treating the tumor up here but we've sculpted around their optic nerves and likewise you know, um, radiation isn't encroaching into the eye um, this is if i'm honest slightly misleading uh, these are sort of threshold pictures so what i'm showing is amounts of radiation that's required to treat the tumor um, if you sort of showed all the radiation what you would see would be um, a kind of a low dose of radiation sort of spread over the rest of the um, rest of the skull um, so the planners will um, carefully um, optimize these treatment plans um, every patient who comes for radiotherapy has a bespoke plan made for them specific to their cancer as their internal anatomy um, all of this happens behind the scenes um, so one thing that's great about today is it's great to be able to tell you about it um, if you're a patient who comes for treatments um, you probably won't see any of that um, what you'll be aware of um, is that a multidisciplinary team uh, will discuss your cancer and treatment options and radiotherapy may be one of the things that is offered to you um, and they'll include all of the diagnostic information um, that they have to hand and they may well order more um, again going back to the very start not a doctor so this is one of my things that um, uh, uh, one of my clinician colleagues would be much better answering questions about one of the things you may well have noticed is that the accuracy of radiation delivery is key um, we need our patients to be in exactly the right place 
and if required, uh, one of your first appointments to radiotherapy will be to the Moldrum, um, where some bespoke immobilization equipment will be fitted for you. Um, the purpose of this is to make sure that the, uh, the patient is in exactly the same position all the way through their treatment. Um, all the plans that we made assume that the patient stays the same shape and we can adjust them as we go along um, to some degree and we account for a certain amount of movement, but it is ideal if, if, um, from a physics and a treatment point of view if patients stay in exactly the same position all the way through their treatment. Um, patients be called for a CT scan, so everyone having radiotherapy um, will have a CT scan. Um, it'll be different to the diagnostic scans that might have been done before um, because these will once will include the immobilization equipment. The CT scan that's taken is used by the doctors to outline the area they'd like to be treated and the areas they'd like to avoid receiving too much radiation. Treatment will be planned as we've seen earlier. Um, and when um, patients um, attend for treatment, um, this is what happens. Um, so as we, we've seen pictures of the linear accelerator before, patients are um, carefully positioned on the couch um, we now have this fantastic technology called surface guided radiotherapy, which creates a 3D map of the patient's surface and ensures that the patient's in exactly the right place even before we've started. Um, uh, that was funded by the um, Robert White's um, Charitable Fund. I'll talk a little bit more about that just before we finish. Before the radiation is actually delivered, um, the machine itself takes a C CT scan of the patient and what it allows the radiographers delivering the treatment to do is to see all the internal anatomy and to line up um, the patient exactly to the radiation fields. Um, patients can attend for anything from one to 35 treatments, depending on the type of uh, cancer and the type of treatment. These are mostly done as outpatient appointments. So people um, come in for the day, they have this 15, 20 minute appointment and they go home again. Um, after the whole course of treatment is finished, um, occasionally during a course of treatment, patients will have follow-up appointments. Um, those are arranged to monitor how their treatments have gone. Um, I mean, let's face it, hoping that all the cancer is gone, um, but also decide when other, whether any further treatment is required. Um, in terms of just an overview of um, the radiotherapy service, so radiotherapy is delivered at Poole Hospital and our satellite centre at the Robert White Cancer Centre in Dorchester. Um, Robert White was a local businessman um, who a few years ago um, had cancer and unfortunately died from it, um, but he uh, left a legacy fund of £10 million to oncology. And it's with that uh, that we built the Robert White Cancer Centre in Dorchester, um, benefiting our patients in the west of the county. Um, we've been able to um, purchase some fantastic new technology the tilting couch, as I talked about earlier, and the surface guided radiotherapy with the red lights that we see on, saw on the previous slide, um, all of which is just to push our radiotherapy treatments um, to be as good as they can be. As a service, we treat about 2,000 patients a year. All of those have specific uh, bespoke treatments platform, and we actually end up delivering about 30,000 individual treatments. Um, so, we see a lot of patients. Um, one of my hopes giving this talk is that some of the people watching will be inspired to, enjoy, uh, to join one of the professions that work in radiotherapy. Um, there are different jobs uh, on the technical side, so radiotherapy physicists like myself. Um, the machines are incredibly complicated and they need a team of engineers to um, help keep them working. Um, or you can work in treatment planning and be a decimetrist and plan those radiotherapy treatments. Um, if you're the kind of person who would like patients, uh, you know, patient facing role, um, and also to work in a technologically advanced area, seeing patients daily and treating cancer, please do consider a career as a therapeutic radiographer um, or apply as a healthcare assistant to work in our area um, you know, or, um, or our bookings and admin team. Um, everyone is required to provide this service in addition to the doctors and nurses that um, everyone knows about already in the NHS. My last thing to say is that I hope you found it interesting. Um, no one wants to get cancer and receive radiotherapy, um, but if you do, please know that there is a team of passionate and dedicated staff working behind the scenes to make sure that every patient's treatment is as good as it can be. Um, so thank you very much. And are there any questions? Sorry.
Um, there are some questions in the chat bar. Do you want me to, to read them out to you? Or are you happy to read them and, and go from there? Um, I'm happy to. I think I can read them. Um, what have we got in the published questions? Can all types of cancer be treated with radiotherapy? Um, uh, no, um, is, is, is the simple answer. Um, there are. In order for radiotherapy to be effective, we have to get enough radiation in there to stand a, at least a good chance of killing the cancer. Um, sometimes cancers are in um, places that are located, they're surrounded by precious tissues and in order to give enough radiation to kill the cancer, we'd end up causing so much damage it wouldn't be worthwhile. Other cancers are incredibly radiation resistant um, and in order to give enough radiation to kill the cancer, you'd cause too much damage for it to be worthwhile. Um, does radiation hurt? Um, no. Um, the in terms of it being um, delivered to you, it is painless. However, as I said before, there can be side effects. Um, in the same way as getting sunburnt is the kind of the closest analogy to it that people have experienced. The process of getting sunburnt, of sitting out in the sun and receiving too much ultraviolet rays and them burning your skin, that bit doesn't hurt. The bit afterwards does. Um, and so the radiation delivery itself doesn't. Um, it's completely painless. Um, but the side effects, um, which are, we try, let's be honest, we try and balance with the um, have balance of side effects um, against the chance of curing cancer, as we do in all medicine. Um, um, some of the side effects um, can be quite painful and long lasting. Uh, question from a member of the public. If I have a metal plate from a broken bone, does this make this therapy dangerous? If it is near where the plate is, is this like putting a spoon in the microwave? That is a cracking question. Um, well done, whoever it was who came up with that question. Um, so the. Uh, so no, it's not. Um, the microwaves only live in the waveguide. Um, so that um, so there's no actual microwaves that interact with your body. And the only thing effectively that hits you and goes through you are the X-rays. Um, the we have to account for the metal um, in your body if you have some. Um, a classic example is a gentleman who are having prostate cancer who have had hip replacements. They have quite a large piece of metal in one or both of their hips. Um, um, metal absorbs radiation very well and we have to account for that because if we didn't, we'd end up under treating the tumour because the metal would absorb the X-rays and it wouldn't make it through um, to get to the cancer. Um, but that's something that we can account for in our treatment planning software. Um, but no, it's it's not dangerous. Um, the other thing to say is that the majority of the time, if you do have a metal plate and some screws holding things together, um, those screws are normally in a sort of surgical cement and which doesn't form part of your living bone. It's bonded to it, but it's not part of it. Um, and as far as all the testing seems to show, that surgical cement is basically radiation proof. Um, it won't become all crumbly on something if um, if radiation hits it. Um, and our last question, how do you get into radiotherapy as a career? Do you have to do a degree in physics first? Um, so as a radiotherapy physicist, um, a physics degree is very helpful. However, all the careers um, have an equivalence route built into them. If you've done something um, in an adjacent field, um, in a form of medical engineering perhaps, um, that you could certainly look at that and um, get a job within radiotherapy um, using that as your equivalence. Um, the uh, physicist jobs um, and the radiographer jobs are effectively degree or master's entry. Um, so there's a um, there are degree courses to become a therapeutic radiographer. Um, we have a stream of student radiographers through the department um, where if you visit, you might see them. Um, and there is a national scheme um, through uh, our governing body called IPEM. Um, for training physicists. Um, in terms of people are like electronic engineers, they tend to come from a much more varied background. Um, so people who've worked in industry before, um, actually uh, ex-Navy um, electrical engineers who are used to working on 
uh, ship radar um, because of the magnetrons that we talked about earlier there's actually a huge amount of carryover um, from the work that they do on radar um, to how our linear accelerators work and they're able to uh, certainly technologically it's, it's a fairly easy sidestep for them Oh, I think you just muted James. You thought that you thought I've learned by now. Um, um, before I let you go, Johnny, there are two things I just wanted to say. Um, um, firstly, thank you so much for giving up your time on a Saturday morning um, to talk to us. But secondly, um, I just want to thank you for, for being gentle with us as well. You, you're explaining incredibly complicated work that you do, incredibly important work that you do, uh, you know, that makes such a difference to people's lives. But you've described it in a way that I think all of us can understand and get a feel for it. So I really wanted you um, to thank you for doing Doing that so well um, um, and um, for on behalf of everyone watching um, thank you so much so if there's anything else you'd like to say um, I shall hand over to you now um, no that's everything Maggie um, the only other thing I was going to say is we're having a linear accelerator delivered today so if you are passing Pool Hospital and you see a large orange crane poking up into the air um, about 50 meters to my left um, there is a linear accelerator coming in through um, a large doorway um, so that's where I'm going next to make sure it's all come in all right but um, yep, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, pleasure giving the talk.